Part 1, The Chancery Court, ITS History, Jurisdiction and Principles Chapter 1, The History of the Chancery Court, Article I, Origin and Evolution of Equity Jurisprudence Section 1, The Civil Law, Its Development The system of jurisprudence called equity was originally largely derived from the civil law of the Romans, and its early development in England was similar to the development of an analogous system in the jurisprudence of Rome. Therefore, in endeavouring to trace the origin of the Chancery Court, it may be well to notice, briefly, the development of the civil law. The early laws of Rome, like the old common law of England, were exceedingly stern, rigid, formal and arbitrary, paying little attention to abstract right and justice. Their judicial proceedings were technical to the last degree. Absolute accuracy was required in complying with the established phrases and acts in the enforcement of civil rights. Any omission or mistake, of a word or a movement was fatal. As civilization, however, progressed in Rome, subtle technicalities gave way to simpler methods of pleading, but even then it was found that cases occasionally arose to which the improved formulas were inadequate. These extraordinary cases were decided by the praetor without being referred to the ordinary tribunal, and without being hampered by any technical requirements as to the proper formula, or kind of action he himself determining both the law and the facts of the case. The complainant stated the facts of his case, the defendant set up his defense. The praetor decided. This extraordinary method of determining suits, so simple, so free from technicalities, so easily molded to the exigencies of every case, was found so superior to even the improved formulas, that eventually it superseded them, and became the only mode of procedure comma much as, in many of the states and in England, the procedure by bill and answer has supplanted the rigid formulas of common law actions. Not only were the pleadings thus simplified by the Roman jurists, but the law was correspondingly improved, and a deliberate and persistent effort was made to bring their jurisprudence into perfect harmony with an absolutely impartial equity, that should do equal and perfect justice to all. And, thus, was perfected that system of jurisprudence known as the civil law from which are derived many of the maxims, principles and doctrines of equity, now followed and enforced in the Chancery Courts. Section 2 Evolution of Equity in England The development of the extraordinary jurisdiction of the Chancery Court of England was similar, in its causes, progress and results, to the development of the system of equity in the Roman law, as already intimated. In England, the king was regarded as the apostrophe fountain of justice, and, when any person conceived that he had been wronged, either in court or out of court, he had the privilege of petitioning the king for redress. The king, being unable to hear and determine all of these complaints because of their number and complexity, generally referred them to his chief secretary, who was called his chancellor. This officer was an ecclesiastic, trained in the law and theology of Rome, and was sometimes called the keeper of the king's conscience. When thus directed to adjudicate the rights, and determine the remedies, of those petitioning the king for justice, the chancellor naturally had recourse to the civil law of Rome, being most familiar therewith, and, also, finding therein a diviner sort of justice, and a simpler and more efficient form of procedure. Besides, these chancellors, who were generally very able and very learned men, were no doubt, disposed to regard the English common law as a barbarous code compared with the Roman civil law. The Chancellor's office was one of great trust and confidence. He was the king's adviser and confidant, the chief member of his council, and the keeper of his great seal of state. He is spoken of, at a very early day, as one who annuls unjust laws, and executes the commands of a pious prince, and puts an end to what is injurious to the people or to morals. Section 3 Character of the First Chancery Suits The Chancellors, following the example of the Roman praetors, applied the equitable principles of the civil law to the determination of all suits referred to them by the king. The suits thus referred were, generally, 1. Applications to obtain redress for injuries and acts of oppression where from the power of the offender, or for any other cause, a fair trial in the ordinary courts could not be had. 2. Cases where there were fraud, deceit and dishonesty beyond the reach of the common law, and 3. Eases where the common law was inadequate to the requirements of justice. In those times of disorder and oppression, many were the appeals to the king by the poor and the weak for protection against the rich and the strong. 
the local magistrates being often overawed, and many were the complaints of want of remedy at law. The king, unable to give personal attention to so many petitions, finally, conferred upon the chancellor full authority to give relief in all matters of grace, as these applications for redress were termed, and from this period petitions began to be addressed to the chancellors themselves, and not to the king. This delegation of authority was made in the year 1348, and, in the next fifty years, the equity jurisdiction of the chancellor was clearly established. Section 4 Principles on which the early chancellors acted When matters of grace were thus referred to the chancellor, he issued a writ commanding the party complained against to appear and answer the complaint, and abide by the order of the court. The principles on which the chancellor based his decisions were those of honesty, equity and conscience. By conscience was meant those obligations one person is under to another to exercise that good faith the other has a right to expect. On an application to Parliament for address, the petition was referred to the Chancellor, with the command, let the be done, by authority of the Parliament, that which right and reason, and good faith and good conscience, demand in the case. Matters of grace being thus brought before the Chancellor, as the keeper of the King's conscience, and he being required to do justice in the king's name, he felt under no obligation to determine the rights of petitioners by that law from which they had fled to the king for relief, and, for reasons already stated, the chancellors, at an early day, adopted the equitable principles and simple procedure of the civil law of Rome, adapting them, with wisdom and prudence, to the emergencies of the particular cases, the matters referred to them being matters of grace and of conscience, the chancellors felt bound to decide the cause according to conscience. The jurisdiction of the chancellor being thus established upon grace and conscience, and his judgments being in the name of the king, and by his authority, whenever the courts of common law were inadequate to the demands of justice, the party unable to obtain relief therein would have recourse to the chancellor, who in his court, called the High Court, of Chancery of England, undertook, like the Praetor of Rome, to administer an equity not found in the law, himself determining all questions both of law and fact, and rendering a decree adapted to all the exigencies of justice. Section 5. The common law as compared with the civil law. The common law was then utterly incapable of doing complete justice in many cases, and, in not a few cases, it furnished no remedy or relief whatever. It had certain rigid molds or formulas, into some one of which every cause of action had to be cast and if the cause could not be run into any of these moulds, there was no redress, and if it could be run into one of the moulds, only such redress as the formula gave could be had, regardless of the equities of the case, and the real rights of the parties. The fictions, formalisms and arbitrary technicalities of the common law, and its dialectical refinements, were inexplicable and incomprehensible jargon to the public and often a costly mockery of justice to the litigants. Those who asked for bread were often given a stone, and those who applied for a fish sometimes received a serpent. Equity, on the other hand, disregarded forms, ignored fictions, subordinated technicalities to the requirements of justice, and indulged in no dialectical refinements. Its pleadings were simple and natural, and its doctrines were founded upon the eternal principles of right as interpreted by a lofty Christian morality. Its great underlying principles, the constant sources, the never-failing roots of its particular rules, were the principles of equity, justice, morality and honesty, enforced according to conscience and good faith, and so adapted to the requirements of each case and the complications of business affairs that the rights and duties of all the parties were fully determined. Section 6 Some of the deficiencies of the common law. The common law then was not what it has since become under the benign inspiration of the chancery jurisprudence. At common law, 1. A vendor's lien could not be enforced. 2. A fraudulent conveyance could not be set aside. 3. A defective instrument could not be reformed. 4. A mistake or accident could not be effectually relieved against. 5. A debt, note or account could not be assigned. 6. A resulting trust could not be set up. 7. A beneficial interest in property could not be enforced. 8. A void instrument could not be cancelled. 9. A will or trust could not be construed in advance of action thereon. 10. Testimony could not be perpetuated. 11. A trust fund could not be impounded. 12. A specific performance could not be decreed. 13. An equitable partition of land could not be had. 14. A deed could not be declared a mortgage.
15, title to land could not be effectually quieted 16, waste, trespasses and other violations of rights could not be stayed, 17, a forfeiture or penalty could not be relieved against, 18, a set-off could not be obtained, 19, land could not be redeemed from a mortgagee, 20, a lien on realty could not be enforced, 21, a lost instrument could not be set up, 22, the estates of minors and lunatics could not be administered, 23, a pro rata distribution of assets could not be had, 24, a contract could not be apportioned, 25, a cloud could not be removed from 1s title, 26, securities could not be marshaled, 27, a partnership could not be wound up, 28, a subrogation or contribution could not be obtained, 29, trusts were not recognized, and could be violated with impunity, 30, a wife's equities did not exist, 31, a title bond was no defense to an action of ejectment, 32, an injunction could not be had in any case, or for any purpose, however great the wrong, 33, receiverships were unknown, 34, equitable rights and interests were not recognized, and, 35, frauds could not be adequately remedied. Section 7 How the law has followed equity Under the influence of the principles of equity as administered in chancery, the rugged features of the common law have grown constantly more and more smooth and humane, and its capacity to do justice has constantly increased. The evolution of the law in England and in America has been on the lines marked out by equity, until, in the language of Lord Hale, by the growth of equity on equity the heart of the common law has been eaten out. To show the effect of the principles and doctrines of equity upon our own statutes the following illustrations are cited 1. The law in reference to gambling and wagering contracts. 2. The whole law of landlords, mechanics, laborers and other liens. 3. The law of notice through registration of deeds. 4. The pro rata distribution of insolvent estates. 5. The apportionment of rents. 6. The provisions for the benefit of married women. 7. The guardianship over the estates of infants and persons of unsound mind. 8. The allowance of set-offs. 9. The right to sue upon a debt, note or account purchased from the original creditor. 10. The statutory remedy of interpleader. 11. The right to set aside the satisfaction of a judgment. 12. The proceeding by garnishment. 13. The right to a sale of land for partition. 14. The proceeding at law to remove a cloud from title by suing a claimant not in possession, in ejectment. 15. The right to defend by title bond as by deed. 16. The power to sell the property of infants and lunatics for reinvestment or support. 17. The right to impound the property of absconding debtors. 18. The remedies by motion allowed sureties. 19. The removal and appointments of trustees. 20. Giving the right to take depositions at law. 21. Making parties witnesses. 22. Providing for the perpetuation of testimony and the taking of evidence to bene ersi. 23. Allowing lost instruments to be proved and authorizing lost records to be supplied. All of these statutes are mere enactments of rights recognized and enforced, remedies employed, defenses allowed, and procedures used, in the Chancery Court by virtue of its inherent jurisdiction, and were wholly unknown to the common law, their recognition in our courts of law depending exclusively upon the statute, and the statute being suggested by the practice in equity. Section 8. The Divine Law of Justice The Rule of Decision. The Statement often made, that the Court of Chancery was established to mitigate the rigor of the common law, and to supply its defects, is not wholly true. This Court was established to do justice, regardless of any and all law. The King deemed it a duty imposed upon his conscience, both by his oath and by religion, to decree justice, and in decreeing justice he deemed himself bound rather by the divine law than by human law, and, when the Chancellor acted in his stead, he based his decisions not upon the law of the land, but upon honesty, equity and conscience, for so was he commanded to do in exercising the king's prerogative of grace. In short, the Chancery Court was established rather as a court based on the precepts of religion than as a court based on the rules of law. It is unquestionably true that the harshness of the common law, its unfitness to cope with fraud, 
its incapacity to do justice in many cases, the defects in its remedies, the opportunities it gave the strong to oppress the weak, and its general inadequacy to meet the requirements of equity, greatly contributed to perpetuate the existence of the Chancery Court, and to enlarge and justify its jurisdiction. Nevertheless, the vital principle from which the court sprung was the prerogative doctrine that the king was the fountain of justice, and that, when a citizen could not get justice in the ordinary courts, he might come to this fountain. The king, in administering justice in such cases, deemed himself above all the laws and customs of his realm, and bound only by his conscience and his will. As it was not a matter of right in a citizen to draw on this reserve source of justice, when remedy was given it was deemed granted as of grace. Section 9 Other causes contributing to the establishment of the Chancery Court, as the Chancery was the office out, of which all writs at common law issued, the Chancellor retained cases for his own disposition when the facts were such that no common law it was adapted to the requirements of the case, or when the common law courts were unable to furnish adequate relief, and some contend that herein originated the extraordinary jurisdiction of the Chancellor. In this class of cases, the Chancellor determined the matters in dispute, so that the court of the King might not be deficient in doing justice, but it is believed that the equitable jurisdiction of the Chancellor originated mainly if not exclusively, from the reference to him by the King of Petitions for Justice and Redress, as already stated. It is unquestionably true, however, that, had it not been for the deficiencies of the common law, the number of these petitions to the King would have been comparatively few. When the lay chancellors succeeded the ecclesiastics, no material changes were made in the jurisdiction of the court. Its system of jurisprudence was, however, enlarged and made more comprehensive precedents were more closely followed, and the decisions of the chancellors more carefully preserved. But the equitable principles of the civil law were as fully enforced, and the peculiar proofs and practice of the court in all things continued, the lay chancellors being greatly aided herein by the masters in equity, who were permanent officers of the court. Thus was established the High Court of Chancery of England, and thus originated the grand system of jurisprudence known as equity both maintaining their existence by virtue, alone, of their inherent merits, and their wonderful fitness for the purposes of administrative justice. It may be well here to remark that, by an act of the British Parliament, which went into operation in 1875, all the great courts of England, including the High Court of Chancery, were consolidated, and a system of pleading and practice adopted similar to those in use in Chancery. The Act of Parliament also provides that in all matters in which there is any conflict or variance between the rules of equity and the rules of the common law, with reference to the same matter, the rules of equity shall prevail, and thus in England the triumph of the righteous principles of equity over the rules of the common law is complete, and, no doubt, Final. Article 2. The History of the Chancery Courts of Tennessee. Section 10. The Chancery Court of North Carolina. When North Carolina was colonized by the English, they brought with them, as part of their jurisprudence, the principles and practice of the English Court of Chancery, and incorporated them into their judicial system. As early as 1713, we find a Court of Chancery in existence in North Carolina and it is safe to say that this court was coeval with the first legal institutions of the colony. The Court of Chancery is referred to in the Acts of 1720, ch. 6, of 1723, ch. 10, of 1746, ch. 2, of 1748, ch. 2, and of 1762, ch. 5. The court thus established by the Lords Proprietors of North Carolina, under the general power given them by the Charter of King Charles II, was similar to the Chancery Court, of England, and was held by the Governor and Council. This court continued until the outbreak of the American Revolution, but no provision having been made for its re-establishment under the state authority, it ceased to exist, for a few years, the struggle for independence and the conflict of armies absorbing public attention. The people of North Carolina, however, in their constitution of 1776, expressly provided for courts of equity, and thus recognized the jurisprudence administered by the Chancery Court as a fundamental part of the law of the new state. Although no court of chancery was established, equitable rights continued to exist, notwithstanding, and in 1782 the people discovered, and through their legislature solemnly declared, 
that the courts of law were not equal to the redress of all kinds of injuries, that many innocent men were withheld of their rights, and some deprived of them, altogether, for want of a court or courts of equity. It was accordingly enacted in that year by the legislature of North Carolina that each of the superior courts of law should also be courts of equity and possess all the powers and authorities formerly held by the Court of Chancery under the colonial government, and that were properly and rightfully incident to such a court, and not inconsistent with the laws and constitution of the state. This act prescribed a procedure for the court, and granted subpoena, and such process to enforce decrees as belonged to courts of chancery. All matters of fact were triable by jury, as in suits at law, costs were to be paid by either party at the discretion of the court the proceedings of the court were to be kept distinct from those of the law court, and it was expressly declared that the court should be a court of record. Apostrophe the English court of chancery was not a court of record, and the statement in some of our reports that by our acts of 1787 and 1801, our court of equity is a court of record, seven while true, ignores the previous act of 1782. Section 11. Introduction of Courts of Equity into Tennessee When counties were created in the territory now Tennessee, by the legislature of North Carolina, they were at first made parts of adjoining judicial districts in that state, but in 1784, the counties of Washington, Sullivan, Green and Davidson were constituted a separate judicial district, and named the District of Washington. This district covered the whole of the territory now Tennessee, but, in the following year, Davidson County was given a separate court. The courts thus established in this territory by North Carolina, were vested with general jurisdiction in law and equity. Eight. In 1787, the twofold court of law and equity was divided, and it was enacted that the chancery branch of the court should be styled the court of equity, and a clerk and master in equity was appointed for each court of equity but both courts continued to be held by the same judge. This act authorized publication as to non-resident and absconding defendants, and provided that executions to enforce money decrees might issue as at law, instead of the then mode of enforcing money decrees by attachment, habeas corpus, attachment with proclamation, and commissions of rebellion. In 1790, the territory now Tennessee was deeded to the United States by North Carolina, and the Act and Deed of Session provided that the laws of North Carolina should continue in full force within the territory until repealed, or otherwise altered, by the legislative authority of the territory. In 1793, by an ordinance of William Blunt, territorial governor, the counties of Knox and Jefferson were formed into a judicial district, called the District of Hamilton, and the courts of law and equity therein were ordered to be held at Knoxville. The first session of the first territorial legislature met in Knoxville in 1794, and the first act passed by it declared that the North Carolina Act giving equity jurisdiction to the superior courts of law should be in full force and effect. This same legislature created the judicial districts of Washington, Hamilton and Monroe and vested in the courts thereof the general equity jurisdiction conferred by the Act of 1782 and thus the peculiar powers, pleadings, proofs and practice of the Chancery Court were formally made a part of the jurisprudence of the new territory. Section 12. The Development of Our Chancery Courts. In 1796, this system of equity jurisprudence was incorporated into the constitution of the new state, and thus embedded in the very foundations of the government. In 1801, an act was passed to regulate the proceedings of the Court of Equity. This act prescribes in detail, the practice of the court, and a large proportion of the provisions of the act are in force today. Among the changes made in the practice by this act was the power conferred on the Chancery Court to divest title to land, instead of requiring parties to convey, as had hitherto been the practice. In 1809, the superior courts of law and equity were abolished, and circuit courts established in their stead and invested with all of their powers and jurisdiction both at common law and in equity. A Supreme Court of Errors and Appeals was created by the same statute, to be composed of two Supreme Judges and one of the Circuit Judges. By the Act of 1811, this Supreme Court was given exclusive jurisdiction in all equity causes arising in the Circuit Courts, and either party was given the right to take depositions. Previous to this Act, the evidence in equity suits was generally oral. The Act of 1811 
repealed so much of the Act of 1809 as authorized circuit judges to sit with the Supreme Judges. In 1813, the circuit judges were given concurrent jurisdiction with the Supreme Court in all equity causes, and the circuit clerks were made clerks find masters in equity. In 1817, it was provided that equity causes, wherein a circuit judge was incompetent, might be adjourned to the Supreme Court, and the heard on the original papers, as though brought there originally. In 1819, the old practice allowing witnesses to give oral evidence in chancery suits, and the law compelling their attendance, were repealed, and it was enacted that depositions should be taken in all chancery cases. In this act, the circuit courts sitting in equity causes, are styled courts of chancery. In 1822, it was enacted that the chancery courts should be held by one of the judges of the Supreme Court, and in 1824, a chancery court was required to be held twice a year in each circuit. Finally in 1827, the laws giving the Supreme Judges original chancery jurisdiction were repealed, and two chancellors were appointed to hold the chancery courts. At the same time the state was laid off into two chancery divisions, the eastern and the western, with one chancellor for each. The chancellors were declared to be chancellors for the state, and were given authority to interchange. Section 13 How our chancery courts were finally established. In 1834, a new constitution was formed, which recognized the several courts of equity as part of the judicial power of the state, and authorized the establishment of courts of chancery, and the appointment of chancellors and clerks and masters. This constitution continued all laws and ordinances then in force and use until all to door repealed. The first legislature under this constitution increased the number of chancellors to three, and vested them with the same powers, privileges and jurisdiction in all respects that the chancellors then had by existing laws, and that were properly and rightfully incident to a court of chancery, agreeably to the laws then in force in the state, not inconsistent with the constitution. This statute, in substance, reenacts the North Carolina Act of 1782, and is in force today. The number of chancellors was increased to three by the same statute, and a middle division established. The act required chancellors to make rules with a view to the attainment of the following improvements in the practice. First, the abbreviating of bills and answers and other proceedings, 2d. The expediting of the decision of causes, 3d. The diminishing of costs, and, fourth, the remedying of such abuses and imperfections as may be found to exist in the practice. Bark Chancery Division was subdivided into districts, each district composed of from one to four counties, and the court was held at some one place in each district. The number of chancellors and the number of chancery divisions have been increased from time to time down to the present, but no further changes were made in the status of the chancery courts, until 1870 when the present constitution was adopted. By it the chancery courts are made constitutional courts, and thus put beyond the reach of the legislature. In 1877, the jurisdiction of the chancery courts was so enlarged as to include all civil causes of action tribal in the circuit courts, except for injuries to person, property or character, involving unliquidated damages. The far-reaching effect of this statute is hardly yet fully comprehended but the courts are giving it that liberal construction evidently intended by the legislature, and the result is not only a great increase in the power of the chancery courts to do full justice, legal as well as equitable, but a great increase in their prestige and popularity. Section 14 Growth of the Court in Public Favor The chancery court has been struggling, for over 500 years, to justify its existence, and to vindicate the superiority of its jurisprudence having had a foreign origin when originally established in England, and its jurisdiction interfering with the common law, these circumstances naturally created a prejudice against the court. The fact that its proceedings were out of sight of the people, that it had no juries, that no witnesses were examined before it, and that its decrees were pronounced by a single judge, all tended to strengthen this prejudice. The court, too, laid a heavy hand on great and rich men, and exposed and righted the wrongs committed by designing and crafty men, and required guardians, trustees and even husbands and fathers to do right towards those depending on them, and above all, was quick to detect and correct frauds and unconscientious conduct. Wicked men, thus thwarted in their schemes of wrongdoing, endeavored to justify themselves by abusing the one-man court. But, 
Notwithstanding these adverse influences, the Chancery Court of England continued to grow in power and popularity as the English people grew in civilization and intelligence, until now its principles are supreme in all the courts of that country, as in England, so in Tennessee, the Chancery Court has had its adversaries, and has had its triumphs. Its history, as already briefly shown, demonstrates the fact of its constant growth in popular favor from the beginning of our existence as a state down to the present. By various acts of the legislature, its jurisdiction has been greatly increased, its powers have been much enlarged, its practice has been simplified and improved, and its process made more efficacious. In the language of Judge Freeman, the Chancery Court has been steadily advancing and widening the boundaries of its jurisdiction from its earliest history to the present day. In Tennessee, these extensions of the boundaries of the court have been made by the people, through their legislatures, thus giving conclusive evidence of the growth of the court in public favor. And now, by the Constitution of 1870, it is made the Constitutional Court, and by the Act of 1877, it has been given jurisdiction of all civil actions triable in the Circuit Court except actions for injuries to person, property or character, involving unliquidated damages, thus making its vindication complete, and its triumph perfect and permanent. Equity founded upon the eternal verities of right, justice and morality, rather than upon arbitrary customs and rigid dogmas, and acting according to the dictates of reason and good conscience, rather than unadjustable formulas, has the capability to reach and cover every civil case which can possibly arise out of the transactions of mankind, its doctrines and rules furnishing a sure means of accurately and justly determining the rights and duties of all the parties and its flexible remedies inherent and statutory, adjusting and adapting themselves to all the intricacies of every emergency, so that in our courts of chancery there is now absolutely nothing wanting that man can devise for the perfect administration of complete equity, and there can never be any failure to do adequate justice, in any suit, unless the proof fails to disclose the real facts and circumstances of the transaction, or the Chancellor fails to comprehend the doctrine, or apply the remedy, applicable to the case. Section 15. Equity Jurisprudence, Pleadings, and Practice. In other states, the jurisprudence of equity, and its pleadings and practice prevail in all the states of the Union, and in many of the states have completely supplanted the pleadings and practice of the common law. There is an opinion, somewhat prevalent, that there is no equity jurisprudence in those states of the Union which have abolished chancery courts. This is a gross misconception. The doctrines, principles and remedies of the Chancery Court are in full force in every state, and while, in many of the states, there are no separate Chancery Courts, in all of them the jurisprudence of equity is, nevertheless, recognized and administered as fully as those special courts of equity were in existence. In those states that have adopted the code practice, or reformed procedure, as it is variously termed, instead of the principles, pleadings, practice and remedies of the Chancery Court being abolished, in fact the common law practice pleadings and remedies have been abolished, or greatly conformed to those in Chancery. Under the so-called apostrophe code practice, the principal pleadings are, 1, the petition or complaint, which is identical with a bill in Chancery, 2, a special demurrer, and 3, an answer, which are the same in form and substance as the like pleadings in Chancery. In short, those states that have adopted the code practice, have, in effect, by statute substituted the simple and pliable pleadings of chancery for the stiff and cumbrous forms of the common law. And so, although in many of the states there are no separate chancery courts, yet in those very states the pleadings, practice and principles of chancery are prevalent, and well nigh supreme, although to some extent under new names. And in the federal courts the principles, pleading and practice of equity remain wholly unimpaired.